Hello, and thank you for exploring Lakehead International's videos. My name is Jordan, and I am the International New and Social Media Officer. I'm also the host of the Lakehead International Live series, a fun and informative way for you to connect with current international students, professors, and ask questions about admissions and everything Lakehead. You are about to watch a recording from one of our previous live sessions. If any questions arise throughout the video, please do not hesitate to comment below. If you would like to check out some of our upcoming live sessions, please head over to our website at lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Let's begin. Today's showcase is Entering the Frame, How Movies Draw Us In. I'm joined by a special guest from the Department of English and the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities. In just a moment, I'll introduce him, but I want to thank our audience. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Thank you for checking out another International Lecture Showcase. Hopefully this gives you a good taste into just a sample lecture here at Lakehead University. Of course, something to note is that this is a condensed or a compressed lecture. So your typical lectures at uh, Lakehead University will last between uh, 60 minutes to 90 minutes. And there's even larger or longer sessions where uh, you have more seminar classes. And so on that note, I'll pass over to Dr. Daniel Hanna to introduce himself and share a bit about uh, what he does here at Lakehead. Hi, uh, I am Dr. Daniel Hanna. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of English at Lakehead University. Uh, I do teach film, which is what the lecture today is going to be on, uh, but it's only one of my specializations. I also teach American literature, uh, specifically 19th century literature and comics. Uh, and if you are wondering at any point in this presentation what that accent is, I am from New Zealand. Uh, so uh, if you have any difficulties with the vowels, uh, do you know? feel free to throw it in the chat and Jordan will probably translate for me. Uh, awesome. Thanks very much. I, I look forward to giving this lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Before we actually uh, do the lecture, I'll chat first about our agenda. So I'll go over upcoming events and then I'll actually pass it over to Daniel to begin his lecture. And then we'll have an open question and answer period. So there's a bit of interactivity during our lecture today. There's a poll. And of course, if you have questions for Daniel, please submit those uh, in the Q&A function on Zoom. But first, upcoming events to chat about do include our international applicant and family receptions. So these are for current Lakehead University applicants, students that have applied for fall 2021 entry, whether you've applied for our undergraduate program stream or our graduate program stream, a master's or a PhD, you're more than welcome to come out and bring your family with you. Or even if you're not necessarily living with your family, maybe they want to join from a different computer, they're more than welcome to also register and sign up on their own. Uh, but our next session is Saturday, June 12th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that's Toronto time. Of course, given that our uh, folks are from around the world, uh, you're going to want to do a bit of conversion there to see what time that's offered in your hometown or your home country. And so with that being said, a friendly reminder that we're going to sort of go over all the important topics. We're going to go over quarantine, travel to Canada, Lakehead University, the benefits of studying in Canada, uh, immigration, all that sort of stuff. The key topics as you prepare for your journey to Canada and prepare to begin your studies here at Lakehead University. So you can register for that session online now at lakehead.ca forward slash international dash live. Things to remember throughout today's session, if you like what you see, don't worry, we are recording and we will do our best to get it on YouTube within the next few business days or get you that link to the recording at least. If you do have questions, like I mentioned, you can submit using the Q&A function and I'll be monitoring throughout the lecture. But of course, we also have a behind the scenes team with us today. So we do have Hector, E. Chen and Lauren who are answering questions behind the scenes about Lakehead University, maybe about your application, your residence, your program, what, it, what, what might have you. Uh, please don't hesitate to submit those questions and we'll answer them behind the scenes, but I will do my best work in any questions related to today's topic uh, with Daniel in. And last but not least, I want to encourage you to stay connected and follow us on social media for updates about future webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. And of course, I've mentioned I'm proud to run those channels. And so giving you that important updates, that important information, but also giving you that sneak peek into university life is an important aspect. So I hope that you do check us out. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Lakehead International once again. 
And so with that being said, I'll pass it over to Daniel to uh, sort of begin his lecture. Oops. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Just going to uh, share my screen. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Hello, <laughs> and uh, welcome to this mini lecture entitled Entering the Frame, How Movies Draw Us In. So this lecture is designed to give you a taste of what it would be like to study film analysis at Lakehead University. Uh, it's modeled a little bit on what I do in first year uh, introduction to film studies courses, uh, which you can take through the Department of English, uh, both as an elective or as part of an English degree. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about the ways in which films work to draw us, the audience, into their imagined worlds. How do films use the various properties of cinematic language, mise-en-scene, cinematography, editing, and sound to establish a relationship between the viewer and the audience? Oh, got to find my mouse. Okay, I found my mouse. Uh, in using that phrase, cinematic language, I'm asking us to think about the imagery and conventions of film as functioning like a language with its own vocabulary and recognizable grammar. French director Robert Bresson described cinematography, the art of capturing moving pictures with a camera, as a writing with images and movement and with sounds. So in a film studies course, one of our primary tasks is to learn how to read this language, how to pick it apart and explain its various effects. So cinematic language refers then to the visual and audio vocabulary and grammar of film. And it's composed of myriad integrated techniques and concepts, be that, for example, the staging of close-ups to communicate emotion, the intercutting of scenes to suggest parallel moments in time, or the use of a menacing soundtrack to heighten anxiety. Filmmakers use these various elements of cinematic language to connect an audience to the story being told. But, and this is crucial, usually filmmakers rely on the cinematic language working without the audience noticing. So we might say that it is invisible. So in analyzing film, we're looking to render visible these invisible aspects of film's form. And we're also seeking to unveil other invisible aspects of the movies, such as the ways in which movies communicate certain cultural ideas and values, what we might call the film's ideology. So before I get uh, to an example of such analysis, we're going to do a quick poll that uh, Jordan has ready here uh, about movie genres. So I'm hoping, oh, there it goes. Okay, so it's Saturday night. We're thinking post-pandemic here probably, and you're heading to the movies. If you had to choose a movie to watch from the following available categories, what would you choose? Rom-com, romantic comedy, musical, horror, or action thriller? All right, I'm going to, I think I get to vote. Oh, I don't see how I can vote. Oh, well, never mind. whatever. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna skew it. Um, we're gonna come back to the results of that poll later. I'm not going to pay attention to it yet. Um, I think I can just close this. I can. All right. And uh, so we'll return to that poll a little bit further into the lecture. So let's break down now an example of what formal analysis of film looks like. I'm going to show the opening sequence of the much loved film Casablanca from 1942, uh, starring Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. Opening sequences play an especially important role in drawing an audience into the film's world. Notice here how this opening sequence begins with the camera locating us in an almost godlike position outside the globe as a voiceover narrator sets the scene. With the coming of the Second World War, many eyes in imprisoned Europe turned hopefully or desperately toward the freedom of the Americas. Lisbon became the great embarkation point, but not everybody could get to Lisbon directly. And so a tortuous roundabout refugee trail sprang up. Paris to Marseille. The camera then pulls us down and into the migratory path of the refugees in war torn Europe. And then the film leads us by camera movement across the map from Paris to Casablanca, while through superimposition, a dissolving montage of refugees in motion 
mostly right to left, gives a human face to this geographical path. In French Morocco, here the fortunate ones through money or influence or luck might obtain exit visas and scurry to Lisbon. And finally, the camera pulls us down from the level of the watchtower into the marketplace. We're left at eye level as if we, like the newly arrived immigrants, are finding our feet in this space. And the sequence ends with one large suggested, last suggestive instance of superimposition. So we're just going to go back just a touch here and catch that. And there it is there. So this shot dissolves into the next. Briefly, the trained monkey sits superimposed over the hand of the radio operator. So here we're asked to be a more active interpreter of the film's cinematic language. This strange combination shot could function ironically to suggest that the radio operator, an agent of France's Vichy government, a puppet of Nazi Germany, is something like a trained animal, passively performing the will of his master. To all officers, two German couriers carrying important official documents murdered on train from Oran. Murderer and possible accomplices headed for Casablanca. Round up all suspicious characters and search them for stolen documents. So where camera movement and dissolves in the montage and visibly lead us through time and space, a more active engagement with the sequence's dissolve, final dissolve, reveals the film's ideology, its political viewpoint. Do we have any questions, Jordan, or are we okay to keep going? We're okay right now, thank you. All right. Um, I want now to compare this example of film's invisible language at work with a more recent example, George Miller's Mad Max Fury Road from 2015. While Miller's relentless action thriller might seem very different from Casablanca, it's instructive, I think, to notice the similarities between the ways in which these films draw their audiences in. My name is Max. My world is fire and blood. Why are you hurting these people? It's the oil, stupid. Oil wars. We are killing for gasoline. The world is actually running out of water. So the opening of Mad Max shifts between a first-person narrator, Max, and a kind of sound montage. Like the montage of the migrants in Casablanca, these disembodied sound bites give us compressed exposition, situating us in a world of nuclear fallout. Once, I was a cop, a road warrior searching for a righteous cause. The terminal freakout point, terrorizing itself. That sound montage is then interrupted by the only black and white image in the film, a very brief image of a nuclear explosion blasting a plantation of trees. The earth is sour. Our bones are poisoned. We have become half-life. As the world fell, each of us in our own way was broken. It was hard to know who was more crazy. Me or everyone else. Max's narration then, and its suggestion that the world has gone crazy, cuts to this first full color image of the film. As a voiceover memory plays in Max's head, the camera, much as it did in the opening market scene of Casablanca, cranes down and tracks slowly in, following the two-headed lizard. But if the camera movement pulls us towards Max, his posture throughout this shot and in the next medium close-up, holds him at a distance from us. The rapid cuts that follow do something similar, propelling the film's action and setting Max in motion. And then we return here to the original space only to have the negative space of the car's absence established as anticipatory, a space to be filled by the war boys as they initiate the film's many chase scenes. This extreme long shot here works to isolate Max against an inhospitable landscape, much as the same shot is often used in the Western genre to suggest a clash between civilization and wilderness. That distance is then cut again as the car and Max crash and roll toward the camera. I am the one who runs from both the living and the dead. 
man. Max, as his voiceover indicates, is a man on the run from both the living and the dead. The cinematic language of this opening sequence works both to align us with his struggle and to suggest the ways in which his character might evade our efforts to fully understand him. Whether it be through the shift from black and white to color, or from a slow moving tracking shot to rapid editing, or from an extreme long shot to frenetic close-ups, the opening sequence to Mad Max Fury Road lays bare film's dependence on juxtaposition, on the placement of discrete images, sounds and ideas side by side. For Russian filmmakers in the early 20th century, it was precisely the concussive possibilities of juxtaposition, of bringing disparate images into collision, that became the bedrock of film form. Andre Bazin, a prominent French theorist of film, describes this principle behind the aesthetic of Soviet montage editing. Film works from this perspective by throwing images together so that we have the creation of a sense or meaning not proper to the images themselves, but derived exclusively from their juxtaposition. But where Russian filmmakers like Sergei Eisenstein became especially interested in making the audience feel this kind of collision of juxtaposition, so as to bring about a political awakening in his audience, much of the history of what we call classical continuity editing in Hollywood depends instead on a desire to make the cutting and splicing of film seem natural, invisible, drawing us into a world that feels familiar. And yet despite that desire, Hollywood film frequently finds itself pulled between these effects of cinema's juxtapositional art, both concealing and revealing its editorial practice. Let's take a look at those poll results. Jordan, can we see the poll results? Oh, For here sure, we go. Yes, I'll share those oh, with the audience too. So I'll okay, let you uh, make your inferences there. <laughs> it's an overwhelming victory for action thriller so maybe it's just as well i just showed some mad max fury road um some like for horror some like for rock but no love for the musical that's terribly tragic but uh that's okay i won't take offense um i mean one thing we do in film studies courses that's interesting to think about is is ask questions about why certain genres appeal to us uh, why is it that we feel drawn to tell the same story over and over again, right? That's kind of what a genre film is. You go in and you kind of already know what you're going to get with some variation, right? Uh, and so one of the things we think about frequently in film studies courses is kind of, you know, the ideological um, sort of values encoded in certain genres. You know, we go to an action thriller film, for instance, the popular one here, um, we might expect to see certain kind of conventional representations of, say, masculinity would be something we might want to think about, right? That you know, the classic action hero and what kind of values are associated with that particular sort of masculine figure at the center of many of those films? You know, what do we want them to do for us? What do they tell us about, specifically in a Hollywood context, what do they tell us about sort of American culture? Um, we're going to ask questions here about horror. So it was the, the third most popular in this list. Uh, so that's okay. Um, and some of you may hate horror and some of you may not. I'm not going to show you anything too horrific here. Um, but I think horror is a super interesting genre to think about in terms of the effects that it generates. Um, so I'm going to close this lecture with a brief analysis of another opening sequence of a film. Oh, hang on a second. Got to go back. Uh, in the genre of horror, that is Jordan Peele's Us from 2019, which uses horror to ask questions about privilege in modern day America through a story about a young black family being attacked by a mysterious gathering of doppelgangers or doubles. I'm interested in turning to this film because its opening sequence gives us a clear example of a director making use of film's juxtapositional art to both draw us into the film story world and alienate us. That doubled experience for us is key to the film's own exploration of the double, the doppelganger, as a symbol for the costs of privilege in the USA. Like Casablanca and Mad Max, Us opens with a forward tracking shot, pulling us in this time to a TV screen. The shot is essentially what we might call a point of view shot resembling what a character might see from their sofa in front of the television. Although the forward tracking movement of the camera inserts a difference into that perspective. 
we don't assume that the character is moving closer and closer to the TV. The opening shot cuts from a weather report to an advertisement for an upcoming national event that is Hands Across America. And the advertisement sort of illustrates this through a multiplication of faces. We see these multiple eyes and then many more eyes. We see these multiple mouths and then many more mouths. Uh, and then we have the iconic advertisement for the event itself, which of course also situates us here in 1986 in the film. So it places us in time and space. Uh, and we're getting closer and closer to the TV. And then the opening shot concludes as the screen goes dark with a glimpse in the reflection of the TV screen. So right here, it might be a little hard to make out, uh, but there is the reflection here of the young Adelaide Wilson, the film's protagonist, watching the television from a sofa. So the shot works then both to align us with her point of view, watching what she watches, and to estrange us from her, only seeing her in a dull reflection breaking the illusion of immersion in her perspective to remind us of our mediating role as an audience watching a character in a movie. We then move to the second sequence of the film, beginning with another forward tracking shot that singles out Adelaide once more, she's in the center of the frame here, with her parents at an amusement park on the Santa Cruz Beach boardwalk. So subtitles this time tell us it's the same time, and it places us in Santa Cruz. And the camera moves forward, closer and closer, singling her out as she selects a prize uh, after her father has uh, won the particular uh, you know, attraction here. Uh, and the prize we see in the very next shot is a t-shirt for Michael Jackson's Thriller. Again, sort of, you know, locating it in that particular time. Uh, and we, we sort of tilt up here to see her face. And then we follow Adelaide through the amusement park. She sort of wanders off while her parents are having an argument. She encounters these you know, various uh, figures in that space. She comes to a staircase. She descends down to the beach. She wanders on the beach. And then she sees this kind of, what looks like almost perhaps uh, sort of forgotten attraction, vision quest, find yourself. And she leaves behind her candied apple in the sand, which seems somewhat symbolic. Um, apples, of course, you know, have a long symbolic history. Uh, and she enters into this attraction. At this point, Jordan Peele is calling on his audience's familiarity with the horror genre to build up a sense of suspense and dread. It's, of course, a staple of the genre for characters to enter abandoned, somewhat airy spaces, uh, only to be pulled into an encounter with the horror villain or the monstrous other. And at this point in the sequence, the film has been depending upon a very familiar set of conventions for cutting that allow us to move through the space of the boardwalk and the beach without feeling disoriented. We know where we are in space and the cuts in many ways tether us to Adelaide, tracking and understanding her movements and indeed making the attractiveness of this mysterious vision quest uh, for a young girl also understandable. So she goes inside this attraction, it's pretty spooky, she's wandering around, there are various funhouse mirrors, and then in classic horror fashion, the lights cut out, and it's pitch blackness. Uh, she looks for the exit, but when she gets to the exit, she discovers, in fact, it's a reflection of many different exits, and she can't see where the real exit is. So, you know, increasing anxiety, she's feeling trapped, uh, and then this happens. So that's the start of the title sequence for the film. Uh, we see this rabbit and the camera now begins to track out. And at the end of that title sequence, it's revealed that the rabbit is in fact part of a whole series of rabbits locked in these cages here. So the film uh, in this sequence gives us a concussive juxtaposition between two close-ups of Adelaide staring straight at the camera and we assume at her double uh, and the rabbit forcing us to ask what the connection between these images might be. How is the young girl and her horror at this discovery of a double in the funhouse mirror similar to the rabbit? 
What does it mean for both these figures to return our gaze, looking directly at the camera? Some of you might be thinking of another famous story with a white rabbit as its starting point. I don't know, I don't know if I can see the chat here, but uh, does anybody want to throw into the chat a famous story with a white rabbit in it? Oh, there's the chat. I can see it. Alice in Wonderland. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, let me just close that. So uh, we might here think about how Adelaide, like Alice, travels through the looking glass the mirror in the film's opening sequence here, right? It's a, a very sort of obvious connection potentially to make between these two texts. And indeed, us is frequently interested in this idea of the mirror as kind of access into uh, an alternative world. So the film invites some early answers uh, to these questions about the connection between Adelaide and the rabbit by asking us to make connections between disparate elements of the opening sequence. Uh, the, camera's back, the camera's backward tracking shot from the rabbit, which forms a kind of counter movement to the opening forward tracking shots uh, towards the TV and towards Adelaide, reveals this rabbit to be one of many rabbits encaged in what looks like an abandoned classroom. We cannot help, I think, but connect this to the opening images of multiple faces and multiple eyes and teeth in the advertisement for Hands Across America. So I think what we're doing here is establishing a kind of visual rhyme between these two images. The advertisement uses this multiplication of bodies to suggest a vision of national harmony, a fantasy of Americans bound together, kind of the melting pot. It's the same message as the film's title, which might refer both to a collective us and to the US, the United States. The image of the rabbits, however, as a kind of double or doppelganger for the advertisement suggests a different kind of binding, a multiplication through forced breeding and entrapment. The film will later reveal that these rabbits are the food of an underground army of doppelgangers, but in this opening sequence, they remain unexplained. So that instead by a process of uncanny juxtaposition, they work to, sug they work to suggest a disquieting haunting of an American fantasy of national unity. So where us, like Casablanca and Mad Max Fury Road, uses the cinematic language of camera movement and continuity editing to draw us into the experiences of the main character, Adelaide Wilson, it also reminds us of our own invisible presence as viewers, possibly passive, potentially active, in the construction of this film world. The opening sequence of Peel's film asks questions about the role of the audience. We, like Adelaide, are a reflection on the screen, like the reflection of the doppelganger in the funhouse mirror. So the film not only draws viewers into its world, it turns its intertwined treatment of privilege and horror into a meditation on the spectral presence of us. All right, that's all I've got for you. Awesome. That was incredible. I actually just recently mentioned that I watched us in our pre warm up meeting and uh, here in Canada it's just recently been added to Netflix so I highly recommend to our audience members to check it out. That opening sequence is quite terrifying to be honest I may have voted <laughs> in the poll for horror myself but it definitely uh, frightened me a bit. Uh, so next we'll actually go on to our question period and I do have a few questions already in the Q&A there, but I'll encourage the audience once again, if you have any other questions for Daniel or if any others spark as we continue this conversation about today's lecture, please feel free to submit those now. Uh, the first question I'll ask is uh, from a student who said, how is OTS shot different from POV shot since these two angles offer similar perspectives? Uh, over the shoulder shot is that what they're saying there I, think. I believe so OTS is that a familiar acronym yeah I, 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 the student maybe can confirm that that's what they meant by over the shoulder uh, for OTS although I don't often see it referred to that way um, I mean these are yeah over the shoulder okay good um, yeah I mean that's, a, that's actually a really good question um, because you do have two different perspectives being sort of represented here, right? A point of view shot essentially gives us what we see from the eyes of the character. We assume that the camera becomes the eyes of the character that's looking, right? Um, it's used less often 
than that more familiar, say, over the shoulder shot, which is frequently used in, say, dialogue in a film, uh, where the camera sits, you know, just shy of the camera. And usually you often have shot reverse shot and dialogue, right? You move between a shot of one person talking and then a shot of the other person talking, and the camera is usually situated just behind them. Uh, and so in terms of film analysis, you know, it's really interesting to ask questions about what that means for the viewer, right? You're occupying a slightly different space uh, in an over-the-shoulder spot. You're, you're occupying a kind of objective space, kind of subjective space. It's sort of somewhere between the two. You sort of are aligned with the character, but you're sort of at a distance from it at the same time. In that point of view shot, you get this kind of immersion in the character's perspective, right? And it can be quite disorienting sometimes if it's used, especially in a moving shot, right? Um, that one that I showed where we're looking at the TV screen, that's a, that's a kind of strange case in some ways. It's sort of a point of view shot, but the fact that it moves forward indicates it's not, right? So, uh, you know, filmmakers really play, I think, often with the kind of, uh, the, the, the alignments that we feel as, as an audience member uh, with the characters by using sort of the, the camera perspective to, to manipulate that. Um, yeah, really, really good question. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I'm sure it did, yeah. Um, another question we have is, um, and this of course would be subjective, but what qualities, skills, or traits make a good director? <laughs> That's a really large overarching question. And I certainly don't pretend to be the arbiter of good or bad directors. Although, I mean, obviously clearly like good direction generally involves uh, an understanding of what we're calling here cinematic language, right? If you don't understand the principles of how to, for instance, say, you know, on a most basic level, let's say maintain screen direction. That means making sure it makes sense how different shots work together in order to like compose a, a sort of a space that makes coherent sense to the audience, right? That's, that's a good starting point for a basic level. But then in terms of like, you know, being uh, an auteur, we might call them, right? You know, an exceptional director. I think an exceptional director frequently pushes us uh, in our expectations and plays with film form and makes film form their own. But you know, that's just my that's just my viewpoint. I am not the arbiter of good and bad directors. I don't give out Oscars uh, in my class. Uh, though, you know, I'd love to, and it doesn't mean that I don't shy away from offering my opinion. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, tied into that, actually, and speaking of your class and classes offered at Lakehead, a student would like to know what kind of film classes are offered at Lakehead, and can anyone take them, even if they're not a part of um, your, like, the, the program which is offered within that department? Yeah, so we don't offer a large number of film courses. It's worth noticing, uh, noting, um, you know, the first year film course is the main film offering that we have. Uh, and then later in the degree, um, various people offer uh, fourth year um, undergraduate classes and sometimes master's level courses uh, in film. There's not a lot in between that, although film frequently turns up in other courses. It's just not, it's, for instance, we have a science fiction class in the second year that incorporates film as well as text for instance. Um, can anyone take them? That was the question. Yeah, anyone can take them. So there's no prerequisites for taking the film course. And frequently uh, in the first year film course, I have students from um, various you know, different disciplines taking it as an elective. And indeed, actually, I, it's one of the reasons I love teaching the courses that I don't just get to teach English students. Uh, I get to teach you know, students from all kinds of disciplines with all kinds of backgrounds. So also frequently are massive film fans. And sometimes I feel they've watched more film than I have. Um, so that's always super fun. For sure, yeah. Even being a business graduate of Lincoln University, in my first year, I uh, did a gerontology course, and we had film worked into that course. And one of my best friends graduated uh, from history, and many of those courses involved sort of the history of film, also, and how uh, right. different wars or yeah. or, or major yeah, events that's... within the global perspective were played out in a Hollywood-esque style so but, yeah that's a good point but the history department also has some sort of interest in film and runs a, se a separate set of film courses so there are a variety of other ways and also the other thing I should probably point out I, I perhaps was just speaking for the English department here but there was also a media and communications um, offering and Aurelia and I know that they have film offerings as part of that as well so for sure there are a variety yeah. of different ways in which you might encounter it 
And so that, that's a great segue into my next question that I'll answer for uh, us. It says, does film studies focus only on the analysis of films or do we have the opportunity to be on set such as produce, edit and direct? So I'll answer that and um, say that on our really a campus at Lakehead University, we do offer media, film and communication as an undergraduate degree program. And so within that four year program, you will actually have an opportunity to do an internship with a local community organization, non-for-profit, broadcasting company. I recently got to sit down with uh, a girl named Christy who is a student in Aurelia who is graduating this year and she got to work with one of the major producers, Rogers, here in Canada. And she was actually able to be behind the scenes of news broadcasts and help produce and edit and work on sort of visual effects, sound effects, all that sort of stuff. So she got a really great hands-on experience. That's one of many of her classmates that also had similar experiences, whether it was at the Rilia Arts and History Museum. Um, I believe there is one student who worked for the city of Aurelia and helped them with tourism. So there's a really wide variety in being able to have hands-on and experiential learning within media, film, and communication. Um, I am not going to claim I know all four years of programs and courses that you'll be taking. I 100% know that there will be certainly analysis of films built into probably a vast majority of those courses. Um, but also, I, I think what we are trying to sort of expel or, or share with the audience is that with your degree at Lakehead, you really have the opportunity to carve your own path or pursue your passions. And like Daniel mentioned, whether you're a business student or an engineering student who simply wants to take that film course in first year out of passion, we love to see that and we love to see you carving that degree out so that you both get what you're, you're coming for at the end of the day, your, your final degree, but you get to pursue other passions and work in other interests, whether it's going to be in uh, a minor setting or even a specialization. So on that note, we've had a few more questions come in. Um, this one is another personal one for Daniel. It says, do you have a favorite or top three moments in cinema that you have felt captured the best shots and perspectives to advance the film or moment? Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big question. <laughs> yeah. It is, yes. Um, top, top three. Uh, yeah, I, I really be pulling up some fairly random examples here. I think, I mean, a lot of good films obviously have good moments in them that kind of, you know, transform films and, and, and suck you into them. One, one sequence I love teaching is enormously obscure, um, but it's a, a Tarkovsky film. Um, uh, it's called, it's going to go out of my head right now doesn't matter. Um, in this film, there's this one scene in which is a, a character goes to a shrine and has to hold a candle. And they're supposed to, in order to sort of make things happen for them, they're supposed to carry a lit candle across this. Um, it's kind of like a sulfurous pool, but the water's kind of mostly disappeared from it. And they're supposed to walk across the sulfurous pool to the other side with this lit candle without it going out. The shot is eight minutes long. <laughs> and and, it is, and it's in a continuous shot. So it's what we call a long take. The camera never stops shooting, right? So, um, and he walks across really slowly, gingerly, the candle goes out. He walks back. He walks across really slowly, gingerly, the candle goes out. He walks back, right? And, and um, it's enormously engrossing, right? So it's a really good example of how a very slow, very slow film, right? That might really, you might feel, oh God, that sounds like such a snore. I don't want to watch that. Actually, it becomes enormously, um, you become very invested in it, right? Uh, and I, I play this in class. Students at the start are like, what is he showing us? But by the end of it, they're like, come on, get across, <laughs> get across with the candle. He does make it, spoiler alert. Um, but, uh, and he collapses, right, at the very end. And you kind of feel like you collapse as well at the end of the shot too. And so it's, it's both, um, you know, it's a really good example of being drawn into a character's experience but you're also really sort of focused on the idea that the camera never stops shooting right they had to get this all in one shot for it to work so it's also a shot that makes you really think about the techniques of you know holding film in this particular way um so I love that particular I'm not going to give you one I'm not going to give you three <laughs> I, might, yeah. I might talk for, talk forever if I give you three but that's one that I particularly love I'm curious on the back of that response um 
Can you sort of walk us through what a director, and maybe in a director's mind, or, or what is the purpose of doing those long take shots where, in my uh, opinion, or, or my experience watching films that do those long takes, it's almost anxiety inducing because there's no natural pause, or there's no cutaway scene, there's, there's no fade to black no. to get to the next, no superimposition, so you're almost always your, your blood pressure is always rising. You're, you're wondering what's going to happen next. What would a director's purpose of that be? I mean, I think that's certainly something that a long take can do is generate that kind of emotional heightening of, of what's happening. That's particular to that example I was talking about. But I think there's a range of different things that long takes can do, right? One of the things I think is really important about film analysis is just to keep in mind the context of the shot and what you're watching, right? The same shot doesn't mean the same thing in two completely different films. It depends on context. Um, so, you know, a long take, for instance, uh, the start of James Bond or the James Bond film, Spectre, begins with this five minute um, opening sequence that, that is one take continuous, right? And in some ways, I don't really think it's about tension so much as it is about drawing our attention to the amazingness of the shot itself, right? You kind of, you're watching it after four minutes, you're like, holy crap, the shot's still, you know, still going. It's kind of about the kind of expansive sweep of the camera. But another movie like say um, 19, is it 1918? 1917, I think, the war 1917, film. I can't remember which date it is. I could be wrong um, too. That, now, to be right, now that's almost a continuous long take film, right? Um, they've, they've kind of hidden the cuts but there's some extremely long takes in that film and in that one it's all about heightened tension right you just you're just waiting to breathe and you never get the opportunity to breathe right so you're kind of you know really sucked in to the drama of these you know these people trying to avoid mines and avoid the enemy and uh, i think that's a really clever use of the, of, of the long take in that particular film but certainly yeah um, so we have a few other questions here. Uh, one of them, just in general, uh, for Karan, it says, is there a movie that you would recommend that students should watch? So that's another broad question there. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many good films out there. Uh, I would hate to like, you know, restrict you to one particular film that is the key. You know, the thing that people always uh, used to do in film studies would say go watch Citizen Kane or go watch Vertigo and I do teach those films um, they're both amazing films often turn up number one on the list of films and they're there for a reason um, but you know they're also they're not the be all and end all of film you know I, I think it's really important to just keep a really broad um, approach to film to be willing to watch uh, foreign film, be willing to watch black and white film, be willing to watch genres outside of your comfort level, <clears throat> musicals, uh, <laughs> no, to be willing to watch, you know, anything that you might not have expected to watch the first time, uh, because, you know, there are so many good films out there doing so many things in, in different genres that it's, you know, well worth sort of, you know, getting a sense of the range of things that film can do, rather than asking one film to be the film that rules them all. Uh, to you know, quote Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no, I, I actually love that response because I think it. I agree. It's it's really important to uh, immerse yourself in a diversity of films because if you stick to that one genre or that one film type, and that's all you watch and that's all you ever watch, it's really hard to comparatively and analyze sort of the difference within that genre itself because you don't have the experience of so many other different methods of storytelling. So. I'm glad that you didn't. Um, I noticed, just gonna, just gonna say, I noticed that attendee has written um, Stalker, which I'm assuming is not, you know, uh, just they're just stalking us. Um, but I think they're actually giving us the name of a Tarkovsky film there, saying it might be the one I was trying to remember. It wasn't, but it has helped remind me the film I was thinking of was Nostalgia. Um, but Stalker was also an excellent film. <laughs> we had a few uh, guesses, actually. I was wondering what the, the one word responses or questions were. Is someone else guess uh, Solaris? So one oh, person also, did say also an excellent, Oh, somebody did nostalgia. There we go. <laughs> 10 points to you. I just saw that. Um, <laughs> excellent. Solaris is, is great too. I love Solaris. Um, if you're looking for an excellent sort of sci-fi film, um, the original Solaris is, is magical and weird. Very weird. <laughs> Very slow. Fair enough. Um, yeah. um, another question we said is, uh, we have in front of me is, what is your take on third cinema style? I would, might want them to describe what they mean by third cinema style there. I'm not exactly sure what they're referring to. For sure, yeah. So to that audience member, if you're still with us, uh, elaborate on what you mean by third cinema style, and of course, we'll be happy to answer it. In the meantime, another student uh, said, is filmmaking all about deceiving the audience just like a magic trick? 
I mean, um, Orson Welles made a film about this. I think it's called F is for Fake. Um, I mean, yes and no, right? <laughs> Those long takes are the ones where you can't hide, right? Where it's not possible to sort of, you know, deceive. Um, is it about a magic trick? I mean, many filmmakers have kind of, you know, I, I think uh, asked that question in actual films, right? Um, I'm trying to think of what that... Uh, the name of that film that's about a magician uh the, the same prestige? guy who did the prestige thank you there we go yes. yeah and that's an excellent film for, for for thinking about film as magic right um yeah there is something magical about film there should be right and unfortunately in a film studies course it's about revealing the magic behind revealing the tricks behind the magic right that's kind of what we try to do um but certainly you know i think I think there's a mix in films sometimes, right? Some films want to give you all the magic and don't want you to ask too many questions about it because it'll spoil it. See, say, for instance, any, any film in the Marvel franchise, right? You're not really supposed to ask questions about how this was made. You're supposed to just enjoy it and immerse yourself in the effects. But other films might specifically want you to think about, you know, how the camera did that or why they cut in this particular way. Uh, and invites, I think, a very different kind of uh, approach to to analyzing it, and just to just to sort of you know watching and enjoying that film. All right, we've got a definition here of third cinema. Uh, is it part of who appeals to masses by presenting the truth and inspiring? Okay, sure. So we're here with okay. I have a sense of what you're talking about now. Uh, was the question, what do I think about third cinema? Was that what the question yes. is? Yeah. I'm not a. I'm not a posed to third cinema if that's the question i'm not i'm not entirely sure um i mean uh there was a this is connected to a, a bunch of sort of uh cinematic movements that emerged in the 1960s and 1970s as well particularly in south america there's a long sort of tradition of um sort of revolutionary cinema um and i actually sort of teach something somewhat related to that sometimes. Um, I've, I've taught uh, the film City of God, which is by no means, I think in many ways, an example of third cinema, but kind of responds to it. Um, and, you know, certainly one of the interesting things about the history of revolutionary cinema in somewhere like South America is that, like that, those Tarkovsky films I talked about, they were often very slow films. They were designed to disrupt audiences' expectations and to make film into a political event right where uh you came in and you were kind of woken out of your stupor and realized you're part of you know uh your part amongst the masses right which seems you know a perfectly you know excellent aim for film unfortunately the films from what i understand didn't really always manage to achieve that right because people couldn't watch them um so you know there's it's really interesting to think about the revolutionary potential of cinema uh, and different ways in which different cinematic forms can achieve certain kinds of political ends, right? That's definitely something we think about uh, in film studies. Um, and, you know, any film is political in the end, right? Uh, it's just that sometimes films are politically conservative, right? Uh, and it's always important to ask questions about how films manage that kind of uh, sort of political messaging as well. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think that answers your question. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so to our audience, once again, if you have any other questions, we're happy to answer some more questions here. Um, so far, I think we, we've covered quite a bit of ground, though, and we've dove into the topic even further and, and addressed quite a bit of uh, topics related to cinema and film. Um, with that being said, of course, uh, we, with all of your teachings or all of your understandings that you'll take away from today's lecture, um, I encourage you when course registration is open this summer to check out some of those first year courses that uh, Daniel's mentioned about the film, um, film within Lakehead University's core spaces, of course. And then if you have any questions, Daniel, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer uh, more questions about the courses too. I'd be happy. Awesome. So with that, I'm going to advance to the next slide here and I'll chat briefly with, and remind our audience to stay connected and follow us. You can find us at Lake It International both on Facebook and Instagram. You can head over to our YouTube channel, Lake It University. There are two playlists on there that you can uh, explore that are dedicated to our international audience. 
One is simply Lakehead International. I certainly encourage you to check that one out if you're looking to learn a bit more about Lakehead University, but also hear from our current students. Um, plenty of testimonials on there. One of my favorite videos is our off-campus Thunder Bay food tour. So hopefully once you're able to join us here in Thunder Bay, restaurants open back up post-pandemic, um, you'll be able to explore the flavors of the world within our restaurant scene. I think for being a relatively smaller city, I mean, we still have all of the amenities and all of the entertainment that you could uh, dream of in a big city, but also the restaurants there. And we had a current student, Catherine, take us on that adventure and she brought many, many friends along with her in trying out the foods at Thunder Bay. Um, another playlist, though, is the Lakehead International Live playlist, and that's where all of our webinars are recorded and uploaded after the fact. And so today's session, we'll do our best to get it on YouTube. I know that uh, having movies built in um, may flag some copyright issues. We'll do our best to get it to you nonetheless. Uh, but like I mentioned, for that student that was looking at media, film, and communication, I encourage you to check out the webinar called Research at Lakehead. And you can actually hear a little bit more from Christy, that media, film, and communication student. And on that note, I'll remind you also to take a virtual campus tour. If you head over to lakehead.ca forward slash tours, you can explore our facilities, our residents, the, the home that we get to call uh, campus, and the nature and beauty that surrounds us. Um, I, I think once you see it, you'll also be pretty set on Lakehead University. And so on that note, I want to thank our audience for joining us once again. I think today's lecture was a smash hit. We had plenty of uh, questions from our audience, and I thank you for that. Whether it was your morning, your afternoon, your evening, thank you for your time. And to our audience, our panelists, pardon me, specifically Daniel, thank you for joining us and sharing your insight and, and giving us the lecture you did today. To your behind the scenes team, of course, thank you always for your support and helping with these webinars. Thank you for checking out today's video. If you have any questions, you can always comment below. Stay connected and follow us on our social media channels to stay informed about upcoming webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. See you next time.